Amen. 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 Oh, man. <laughs> what a mighty God we serve. You have a Bible, right? Figured you'd get a little lazy, so I want you to open yours today. I'm not going to put it on the screen. <laughs> Aww. You know, some of you don't carry Bibles. You got it on your phone and your pad. As long as you're not playing Candyland or whatever, <laughs> get it out. How should I know? <laughs> Candyland, I played with my granddaughter. That's what that is, all right. Can you get it in an app? <laughs> John 19, where I want you to turn in the scriptures to. So we're going to be receiving, as Tim said earlier in our welcome time, that we're receiving the, the Lord's Supper today together in communion time. So as, we approach East, as we're getting near Easter, this is, I think, an appropriate week for us to share together and just get back focused about the Lord the loss that was suffered there and everything that was gained there as well. Amen. And uh, so I, I want you to just put everything out of your mind. Jesus said, as often you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And so we're going to look at John chapter 19. I'm going to start with verse 16. It's a little bit lengthy of a read this morning, but I think that uh, you'll appreciate the written word as we share it together. So he then handed him over, Jesus, to be crucified. They took Jesus, therefore, and went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him. With him, two other men, one on either side and Jesus in between. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It was written, Jesus the Nazarene, King of the Jews. Therefore, many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew and in Latin and in Greek. So everybody understands what it says. So the chief priests of the Jews were saying to Pilate, uh, do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. They want to do a little editorial privileges here. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. And the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer garments and made four parts a part to every soldier, and also a tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture. They divided my outer garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, behold your mother. From that hour, the disciples took her into his own household. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scripture, he said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. And they put a sponge full of the sour wine up upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. And the Jews, because it was the day of preparation, so that the bodies not, would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. And so the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and the other was, was crucified with him. But coming to Jesus, when they saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately the blood and the water came out. And he who has seen has testified. Now catch this verse here. He who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true, and you know that he is telling the truth so that you may also believe. For these things came to pass to fulfill the scripture, not a bone of him shall be broken. And again, another scripture saying, they shall look upon him whom they have pierced. As you look at this passage today in John 19, it's just one of many places in scriptures where you, you see a crucifixion story told. One of the things you can do sometime and perhaps in your own study is just lay out the events of the day. From the time they arrest him to where they go, from there basically in Gethsemane where he's, he's praying and he begins to shed his blood, the arrest takes place. From there, they take him up to the palace, the high priest palace of Caiaphas and Annas, where he's questioned, pushed around, slapped, mocked, 
left in a pit overnight because they could not take him to the Romans until it was morning. Then they take him out of the pit and they carry him up to Pilate. Pilate interviews him. From there, he sends him to Herod's house. Herod doesn't want anything to do with him. They mock him, crown him with thorns, send him back to Pilate where he's scourged at 39 lashes. From Pilate's house, he goes now uh, before the, 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 the crowd, which begins to chant, crucify him. At that point, Pilate gives over and in, washes his hands. He thinks of the whole situation and sends him out to be crucified at the beckoning call to the crowd who yelled, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. You know, the, the amazing thing here is, as you look through all of this, is that it's just about, you see from Gethsemane on the blood of Jesus Christ being shed. Someone said, you know, the, the Christian religion is a very bloody religion. It is, because if there's no blood, then there's no forgiveness. If there's no blood, you're yet in your sins, the scripture says. If there's no payment for your sin, then there's no hope. We were condemned. We have, no, we have no life. We have no full life. We have no abundant life. We have no future. All we can face is judgment. All we, we have to look forward to is an eternity of damnation and hell and fire and brimstone. That's all there is for us if there's no blood. Because the scriptures make it clear because of man's sin. Without the shedding of blood, there's no removal. There's no remission of our sins. The blood had to be spilled on, on our behalf. And Jesus came, readily yields himself, and readily gives himself to the shedding of blood. One old preacher put it this way. You take the Bible, you cut it anywhere and it bleeds. And that's true from the book of Genesis, where sacrifice is being made, the slaughter of an innocent animal being made for the sins of Adam and Eve. All the way through the Old Testament on to the New Testament, you see the blood and the message of the blood and the necessity of the blood because the wages of sin is death. Blood obviously signifies and the shedding of that blood obviously tells us the story of death. Ephesians 1, 7 says, through him, that's through Jesus, we have redemption. Redemption, forgiveness of sins. Redemption basically means to purchase something, to pay for it. Well, what was the price to be paid? What was being purchased? Well, what was being purchased was you and me. That's what's being purchased. You're, you're what Jesus died for. You're the reason. I'm the reason for the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the reason behind it. What was the cost? The cost was the blood of Jesus Christ, the death of Jesus Christ. Again, if it's not his death, then it's your death. You have nothing to look forward to. There's no hope for you. There's no escape. There's nothing but judgment that awaits us if there's no death and no price. And even if you have to pay the price yourself for your own sins, it's never satisfied because the judgment is an eternal death. I hate to tell you, there's no expiration on eternal. You know? It's just, no, there's no point when you look up and say, oh, when's this expire? Uh, December 12, 1999? No. There's no expiration date. So we're, we're condemned to suffer an eternal death because of sin. But Jesus comes in, steps in the, on the scene, born of a virgin, the truly God, truly man, goes to the cross, lives a perfect life, sinless, stands at the cross, stands in the judgment of men and sinners, pronounced to die, and goes to the cross like a sheep led to its shears, the scripture says, like a lamb to the slaughter and opens not his mouth, and there he dies for us and dies for our sin. What a sacrifice. 1 Peter 1 says this in verses 18 and 19. It says, it was not with the we were not purchased and redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold. Hebrews says it wasn't the blood of bulls and goats, but it was the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we, we celebrate this time of year as we come to Easter. And what a glorious time, you know. My, my favorite Sunday of the year is always Easter, you know. We, we, you have people come to church who don't hardly ever come to church. Come on Easter, you know. Easter is just a glorious celebration day. But the, without the cross, there's no Easter. <laughs> without the sacrifice, there's no Easter. Without the blood of Jesus, without his willingness and his submission. And, and I mean, sometimes we just let it go through one ear and out the other. We're, we're, I have to realize, maybe I just say it one more time. The Bible is not a book of fairy tales. The Bible's not like Grimm's book of fairy tales or something like, or he says fables. The Bible's a reality. Jesus Christ, the living, eternal Son of God, became a man. And he lived on the earth. 
it, it's, it's true. It's very, there's more history written to prove the life, the existence, and the death of the Lord Jesus Christ than there is evidence written about any Caesar or any other historical figure. He lived. Amen. Praise the Lord. He came. And he died on your behalf. And on my behalf, the price was paid. The blood was the price. There's a lot of people who who are out in the world to simply seek to disprove the, the, the crucifixion and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's always interesting. It's, it's, the, it's at the season of the year. You always get those Hollywood pictures and movies that come out, and many of them you know, are trying to undo the whole story and rewrite the history of the moment. And they keep doing it every year. So, or you always got the History Channel or the Geography Channel coming out with some docudrama or documentary to disprove you know, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a waste of time. One young preacher told me, he said, when, it, when he went to uh, Bible college, at the first of his, his ministry, he, ran, he had a philosophy teacher, which is pretty much an atheist, to, to, to convince him that, seek to convince him that, that Jesus really didn't die as recorded by the scriptures. He couldn't have died that way. It wasn't physiological, uh, physiologically or biologically possible as the description of scripture says. He, he said, what do you mean? He said, well, if Jesus, uh, uh, when he was pierced with a spear, you know, uh, uh, water and blood shouldn't come out. You see, because when you die, uh, due to gravity, all the blood kind of starts settling down and usually settles around the waistline. So, you know, that's where the blood is. Well, he went home discouraged, you know, and you just go back and read the Bible and you see what happens and begin to compare what happens even medically with the life of Jesus and the death of Jesus. You understand Jesus just didn't die because of the nails and because of all those things that were happening to him. He died for your sins and it was he who ultimately of himself by his own power and by his own volition, he gave up his life. Remember, he is the Son of God. He is life. There is no life without Jesus. The Bible says all things are by him. All things are from him. Hey, if it wasn't for Jesus, the world would blow up in an instant. He is the one who holds all things together. Every molecule, every cell of your body is held in place because God created it that way and makes it work that way. If it were not for him, it wouldn't work that way. What happened at the death of Jesus was unique. And if you followed the story of the scriptures, even as we read it today, you see that the philosophy professor was an idiot. He just needs to read the story a little careful. Jesus gave up his own life. It wasn't by natural causes. And he gave up his life. And in that moment of giving his life, something unique happened. There is a, a condition called cardiotaponade. And what happens with cardiotaponade is that, that there's this pressure around the heart that keeps building and building. And it can be due to lots of different reasons, stress or whatever. In Jesus' case, he's becoming our sin. And it's, it's, it's like taking a rubber band and pushing it as far as you can apart from itself until it explodes. And what happened literally, if you read the description of what happened, Jesus' heart, is, he's giving it up at this moment. He, he says, it is finished, and he breathed his last breath. He just gives up at that point. And at this moment, according to, if you take it down and break it down medically, what happened to the heart of Jesus was cardiotaponate. And when that happens, that explodes that bursting heart takes place and the muscle explodes like that, the fluid around the heart that's there to protect the heart, which is called the pericardia, all of a sudden all the blood seeps into that outer part of the heart and it gathers and pulls there. So that when they crucified Jesus, instead of breaking his legs, they came with a spear and they pierced his side. And what flowed out? The water and the blood. Well, you think about the tremendous weight of sin, you think about the tremendous pressure. But I don't want you to just think about it in a global sense of Jesus dying for the sins of the world this morning. What touched my heart today as I think about this, and even in the first service, I like to have not got it through, it, was just, it became so clear to me through the service, is that it was for Joe Arm's sin. It was for me. You know? this, this, this it is finished it, it is on my behalf. Yes, he died for the sins of the world, but I am in that group. <laughs> So he died for me. I mean, can you just personalize that in your, own, in your own mind, in your heart? He died for me. It was for me that Jesus died. I cannot be saved. I, I have no hope. I'm doomed for judgment and hell for eternity. If it hadn't been for Jesus dying for me. I shared with the group this morning that this is Passover. In verse 9 a.m. on Passover, 
when they crucify the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's 3 p.m. in the afternoon, six hours on the cross, when he gives up the ghost, so to say. And he yields his life up. Six hours of this misery. And remember the torture and the beating he's already gone through. The blood's being shed from, from the agonies of Gethsemane, where he says, not my will, but thy will, to Caiaphas' house, to the, to the, to the beatings there, you know, to, to Pilate's, to the judgment hall, to Herod's, to the beatings there, all the way back to the flogging. We, we've talked about the, the flogging and the flagellation of Jesus, of the 39 lashes, you know, where, where what happens literally with, when these whips are laid to the back, it peels the muscle and the, and the flesh off of the, of the victim that's being whipped in that regard. So much so, it's just mutilated. It's, it's worse than the looking at something, you know, horribly disturbing. And all that's left is a thin layer of skin to hold the internal organs in. I mean, this is Jesus on the cross for us. That would kill most people right there. But it's not going to die until it's time. Now, down at the temple, Jesus is facing that. There are thousands of people lined up with lambs presenting them. And there are sacrifices being made. The altar is out there, and as these lambs are being laid upon the altar, their throats are slit from side to side, and blood just pours out. Imagine the massive amounts of blood from these thousands of animals. You hunters know what that's like, when, even when you, you, know, you, you kill an animal, or a deer, or whatever. Can you imagine thousands of them? And the blood is pouring out. You say, well, how do they operate with all this blood coming out? Underneath that altar, the Jews had devised a system to pump up water from below the temple. And there was a system whereby that water would come up and pour over the floors where they were standing. There were, there were it's like channels that were built or, 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 or pipelines, so to say. That water and that blood, the water would wash the blood in those channels and it would pour down and empty out below the temple into Kidron Valley. And that was where all the refuse, that's where the dead animals' bodies were laid, that was where the garbage was, you know. That was all, the, the, the filth of that was, was down there. In fact, there was so much blood, it, it, was, it was said that a lot of the farmers in the area would go down into Kidron Valley and collect the soil because it was such a fertile soil and they'd sprinkle it on their crops from all that blood. But I want you to know on the, this, this holy day when all these animals are being sacrificed and all that blood's flowing down from the temple and it's all going to the Kindred Valley, as you, if you were standing there watching, you know what you'd see coming out of those pipes and those drainages? The blood in the water. The blood in the water. What came out the wounded side of the Lord Jesus Christ was the blood in the water from his own heart, his own life. Don't ever sit around and say, well, God doesn't love me. Don't ever get caught in such a desperation of depression and despair that you think that you're a victim of God somehow. God made his son a victim on our behalf. So many times, you know, we want to blame God for the situation or blame God for the circumstances when we have to realize we live in a sin-plagued world in which Satan is doing everything he can to destroy our lives. And God has done everything that needed to be done to save our lives and to restore our lives. The precious blood of Jesus. So when we come to these times, Jesus said, as often as you do this, you remember me. I don't think the best thing I could think to share with this one was just for us to go back to the cross for a moment like that. For us to realize the value of our salvation. We say it's free to everybody, but it wasn't free. It was a great expense. A high cost, the highest price in the universe was paid for you to have salvation. And yet we treat it like, well, like it's membership at the Lions Club or something it's far greater. Twenty-one when I gave my life to Jesus. And I've probably shared this before. 
messed up, empty, lonely, defeated, depressed, empty. No real friends. That I, a lot of people said they were friends, but no real friends. No real direction in my life. In and out of the party scene, in and out of the drug culture. Just If I'm going to the market to buy something, I'm not buying anything like what I was. <laughs> they ought to, don't even put that on the resale rack. <laughs> Just go ahead and throw it in the trash. Go ahead and throw it in the trash. It's not valuable. It's not worth anything. But in the eyes of God, you hold such value. Because it's not because of you, it's because He loves you that much. And I'd heard the gospel story. I'd been raised in church. I knew the story. And I, I remember clearly that Thursday night that I gave my life to Jesus. And I even shared at the men's retreat that, that night I would have crawled over broken glass. I was so desperate for something different. I'd wrestled with God for several years at this point. I'd, I can't live that way. I don't want that. I can't work for me. I can't do that. You know, I've seen that, done there, been there, tried that. I didn't have any idea what I was talking about. I, I tried religion being better, trying harder, being decent, being a better person. You know, I wouldn't even cut my hair. <laughs> That's how desperate I got. That was a big deal for me. Just empty. The night I gave my life to Jesus was a marvelous, miraculous moment of time. I was baptized the next Sunday. Jim Brown, pastor friend of ours, I grew up with as a kid. Jim Brown baptized me. I was so excited getting baptized. You know, I was. I, I, you know, I want to be first. Let me in the water first. You know. The following week, we took the Lord's Supper. North Shore Baptist Church. And I remember they're sitting there as they passed out the elements and when they came and passed out the cup, I looked into the cup and I was just just thinking about all the Lord Jesus had done. And, you know, they call this the blood of the grape. But what Jesus gave was the blood of his life and his body was crushed. Just to get this, there was a crushing that took place. It broke my heart. I sat there and I took the Lord's supper that day. I told the Lord I didn't ever want to take it again like I'd taken it before as a kid. I just didn't want to live that. You want to go back to that? And help me. Help me. Help me, Lord God. Never to come to that place like I did as a child in the service where it just is something to do. We did it every first Sunday after the first Wednesday of the month. Well, let me take the Lord's Supper where I don't remember you. And I don't remember me. You know, we get some mileage behind us sometimes, and, and we, we, we forget where we came from. And we, we forget what it took to save us. We forget what it means to be saved. We start working deals with God and finagling and saying, well, I can do this, it's okay, I'm under grace. We come up with every excuse we can make to justify how we're living our life when really there's no justification. We just need to come back and get right with God and Fall in love with Jesus again and be what God's called us to be. So I would say today, with the Apostle Paul, he said, you know, I received from the Lord this message about community. And the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And he shared the message with the Corinthian church about what the Lord's Supper meant, that it, it, is, it, is, it is symbolic. And the symbolism is, is weighty. This is bread. It's unleavened bread. It represents the, the, the sinless life of Jesus. This is, this, is, this is the blood of the grape. It represents the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the cup. It represents the cup that Jesus gave that night. So this is the cup of the new cup. It represents even more than that. It represents his actual blood that he shed on the cross for us. That water and the blood that fo flo flowed from the day when, when, from, when his side. It was that blood that flowed from his, from his brow when he was, he was pierced with thorns. It's the blood that flowed from his back when he... When he it was beaten like he was beaten. It was blood that flowed from his hands and his feet. You know, man, I'm not an emotional guy, all right? So, 
But today, I'm just consumed with this. And I think we all need to be. So I ask you today to remember Jesus. Remember Jesus. Not some fictional character. Not some Bible land story. The living Son of God. He risen triumphantly for our sins. Paul told the Corinthians, be careful. Although there's nothing magical and mystical here, there is something spiritual that's going on. Realizing everything this represents, how can we take it with our heart not right with God? So that's why at our church we always give an opportunity for people to get their heart right before they take the Lord's Supper, you know? But to leave here right. And then to realize that in taking it, there really ought to be a personal revival that kind of happens when we receive the Lord's Supper, really. You say, I'm getting it right with God. I'm, I'm, I'm making things right with God today, and I'm not going back to where I was. I'm going to live for the Lord. I would encourage you to get right today. Surrender your heart. Get, get clean before the Lord. Yield whatever he's told you to yield. Move on to what he's told you to move on to. Believe what he's told you to believe. Do what he's told you to do. Stop doing what he told you to stop doing. <laughs> you know, whatever it is. You, you say, well, I don't know what, well, you'll know. God will show you. And if there's nothing, praise the Lord. Paul said, listen, but when you receive the Lord's Supper, you should examine yourself so that you do it in a worthy manner. All right. In other words, how, what's the manner that's worthy? The manner that's worthy means that I have a humble heart. You know, I have a humble heart, and I've allowed God to reveal anything that's not right in my life, and I've got it on the altar. Amen. So I'm going to ask you to stand, examine your own hearts as Scripture tells us to do today. Before we receive.